Sadie. Look at mommy. Perfect. Good. Perfect. Perfect. We're done. We're done. Yes, ma'am. You're done. Oh, wait. Wait, no, 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 no. Wait, they're going to give it out. They're going to give it out. We're going to give it out. Uh, we're going to have communion, but in order to save time, I'm going to have these passed out. Jim, would you pass these out while I'm preaching, speaking? Am I going to disturb you doing this? Hmm? Will you disturb me? I'll cut it short. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> when you run out, I'll stop. Okay. Okay. Now, we're going to talk about, and you don't have to turn to it in your Bibles. I'm sure you heard it many, many, many times, but it's Luke chapter 2, if you want to turn there. Luke chapter 2, and this tells about the birth of the Lord Jesus. <coughs> and then, last week we talked about John uh, the Baptist, how he was foretold to be coming by the angel Gabriel. Well, you know, it's hard for us sometimes because we get so wrapped up in our little lives that we forget that God has a master plan for our life. He's got a master plan for the world. He has a master plan for the whole universe. And sometimes we think that we are in charge, not realizing that God is manipulating things in the background to bring about His purpose in life. So as we read this, I want you to realize that God loves you. He loved you so much, he wanted to be like you so he could come here, suffer the same things that you suffered so that whenever he is crucified on that cross, he can take all of your suffering, all of your pain, all of your sickness, and he can take it far away, as far as the east is from the west. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. But I want to read this and explain some things to you that you might not be aware of. And this is in chapter 2. It says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all of the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up with from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now you have to realize that God <coughs> chose a young girl who was very devout, but she was very poor, and so was her boyfriend, she was engaged. Now, in those days, marriages were arranged, you know. So, if you had a little boy and he was upright and nice, and then you had a little girl and the families liked each other, they could arrange and they said, okay, they would be engaged. So, a child maybe about six or seven years old could say, I'm engaged to so and so, you know. And then the next thing was when they get a little older and they become espoused. Now, they could, in the meantime, they could. You know, say, oh, I'm not going to marry her or I'm not going to marry him. But then when they decide they want to be together, it's called espousal. Now, the espousal is sort of like our engagement, but it carries more responsibility because you could, if you wanted to put away her and say, I don't want you to be my espousal anymore, you had to give her a writing of divorcement. And so when you became espoused, you had to wait for a year or so before you could actually become married and com you know, consummate that union and have relationships together. Well, here the Holy Spirit 
comes to Mary, who's about 15 or 16 years old, and she said, Blessed are you among women that you know the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you and you're going to have a child. And then she says, How can this be? Remember that John the Baptist's father said, Zechariah said, How do I know I'm going to have a child? He said, I am so old and my wife is stricken in years and we're all bent over. And he said, Okay, you're not going to be able to speak until it happens. So for nine months he couldn't hear and he couldn't speak. He, you know. So then after John the Baptist was born, then he started prophesying and said, Oh, how great God was and what a great thing his son is going to do. And Mary, who is the mother of Jesus. So anyway, here's this young girl, about 15 or 16, and the angel Gabriel says, you're going to have a baby, and it's going to be from the Holy Spirit, and you're going to call his name Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, who is the Savior. He is going to be the Christ, the anointed one. And she said, how can it be? And the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And so what she does soon as she finds out, she goes to her cousin, who was Elizabeth, who was John the Baptist's mother. And so there are so many questions there. You say, well, here's a 16-year-old girl, and she's leaving her house in Nazareth, going to the hill country in Judea, which is probably about 50 miles away. Who went with her? Who took her? You know, and it's a lot of questions, but the thing is, she went there and she met Elizabeth and Elizabeth said the baby who was six months old jumped in her womb. Now here, Mary stayed there for three months. If you can imagine, she stayed there with her cousin for three months. If she was already six months pregnant and Mary got there three months, she was ready to deliver that baby. So probably Mary, it doesn't say that in the scripture, but probably she was there when Elizabeth gave birth to John the Baptist. So when she went home, her husband, or her espoused husband, they, they didn't consummate it yet, you know, she's three months pregnant now. And she says, well, it was the Holy Ghost. And he's like, yeah, uh-huh. You know, I bet. Yeah, yeah, you've been away for three months and come back this way. Well, then the angel appeared to him and said, don't be afraid to take her as your wife. And so then we see that he took her. Now listen, they live up in Nazareth. But here is Caesar Augustus. Now Caesar, that he was an adopted child and by Julius Caesar, and they were going to name him, you know, when the Romans came into power, they were going to name him Caesar the king. He said, no, 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 I don't like that name. He said, how about Caesar the dictator? No, 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 I don't like that. How about Caesar Augustus of the gods? Augustus means of the gods. He said, oh, yeah, I like that. And then, you know, the Caesar worship came into being. They started worshiping the Caesars. Well, anyway, he gave this decree that all the world should be taxed. That's all of the Roman world goes all the way from Rome over to Greece and down into Israel and over into Egypt. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And he said, you have to go home to your house of lineage where you were born. Can you imagine hundreds of thousands of people all over the known world traveling at that time? You know, and here Mary is just about to deliver and Joseph comes in and says, I got bad news. He said, we got to go down to Bethlehem. Now remember, they didn't have electric lights, they didn't have cars, they didn't have any type of transportation except a donkey. And here she is, nine months pregnant. She has to go from Nazareth up here in the north in Galilee down to a little tiny town called Bethlehem, Ephrathah, down in Judea, which is 90 miles away. Can you imagine that young girl... 16, 15 maybe, riding on a donkey. It had to take them at least four or five days to get there. And you know, you know uh, uh, how much farther? How, you know, when you're riding in the car with your kids and you're only gone an hour, are we there yet? Are we there? And you know, she's, she was miserable. And when she gets there, 
We don't know how long she was there before she delivered the baby, but it says that there was no room for her or him in the inn. Now, it's not a holiday inn or, you know, a, what, a hot, what's they call it? Motel 6 will leave the light on for you. You know, this, these are houses that are made out of stone, and usually they're one room, probably not as big as this room, and it's got a place where they can live, and then there's a lower place where the animals, you know, everybody then had a donkey or a cow or a goat or something for a livelihood. So they said there was no room. Now, uh, the word for in is called cataloon. And they just transferred it in so it makes it look like you can go there and rest and sleep. Well, a cataloon was just like a house and then, you know, because they were supposed to be very hospitable people and entertained strangers. That's what the Bible says, entertained strangers unaware or angels unaware. So when people came, they had a, a little section, maybe just enough space for somebody to lay down in, and that was called the guest chamber. Well, when they got there, now there were probably a lot of their relatives lived in other towns that came on through there, and they probably got there first. That's why there was no room in those houses, you know, for her to be there. And then another a form of the word, cataloon, was just a structure that had four walls on it, and it was out in the square, and there were animal troughs down through there, so the shepherds or the people who were coming through, riding on their donkeys and all, could get in out of the wind and out of the cold, and these animals would get in there, and then these people would go back a little ledge back here and lay down and go to sleep, you know, till the next day. And that's what it says, that cataloon, there was no room for them. Now, if you can imagine a young teenage girl, nine months pregnant, and she's having this baby, and it says that she had to deliver that baby herself. Usually there's a midwife or somebody. And if you've had children in the hospital, I know when I was in the hospital with my first child, you know, there were women lined up in the hallway. They were getting ready, and they had a big board up there, how far along they were, how many centimeters, and this. And you can go, oh, ah, I don't want that man. I hate that guy. That, you know, and they're out there in agony, you know. So, <laughs> You know, I don't know if you've ever done that. And, I mean, I'm just a young father, and I'm thinking, oh, my, is my wife going like that, you know? And, but she wasn't. She was real sweet about it. She, she came quick and easy. All my kids did. But anyway, that was a blessing. But anyway, here's Mary. She's out there. She delivers this baby, wrapped him in swaddling cloth. They had to go from Nazareth down to Bethlehem, you know, they're tired and weary, and they probably thought, this little guy up there in Rome sitting there making this decree. But, you know, God is responsible for that. Because way back in Micah chapter 5, it says, and, you know, there were two Bethlehems in Israel, one up north and one down south. And Micah prophesied 700 years before, and he said, you know, you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, out of you will he come to rule my people whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. So there he was saying, you're going to have a baby come out of you who has lived forever, from everlasting. And then, you know, so when she was born, then all of a sudden, the shepherds, shepherds were the lowest class they could be. You know, and, you know, a shepherd could not give a testimony in a court of law because they were known to be liars and thieves and things like that. And especially those that are on the night shift, these shepherds are out there taking care of these sheep. And it, remember last week we said that Zechariah, who was there, he supposed that after the sacrifice, he takes fire off of the coal, off, I mean, coals off the fire, puts them in the center, then he gets this incense and puts it in there, and he goes and he stands before the altar of incense, 
and it's right in front of the holy place, only separated by the curtain, and he's there, and it's supposed to be the incense of the people. Well, then, that's the way these shepherds were out there taking care of these sheep. You know, in Jesus' time, you know, Jesus overthrew the money changes in the tabernacle and everything because they were crooks. The religious people were robbing their people. So, here, that the shepherds are out in the field and they see this one angel come and it says, fear not. <laughs> you know, you fear not. All of a sudden, the angel <laughs> appears to you, know, whoa, up there in the sky, you know. And then it says, because for you is born this day in the city of David, Bethlehem, you know, a Savior. That tells what he came for. A Savior. These were crooks. These were thieves. And they knew that who they were. And he says, their Messiah, the Anointed One, is Jesus, the Messiah. So it says that he's not only going to save us, he's the one that's going to be our leader, our governor. And then it says, Lord, the Lord. It means he's all-powerful. And he came to save us. And the way he came to save us, that he presented himself to the off-scouring of the world, the lowest people. He was born in the trough. And somebody can't say, oh, yeah, you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth. He says, oh, no, I wasn't. That cattle trough was only about that big, and it was made out of cement. And you don't know how many cows or how many sheep or how many other animals have eaten out of there and drooled all over it. So you say, sanitation is right out the window. But God was in charge because 700 years ago, he said where the baby was going to be born. And then you go over into Zechariah, and Zechariah says that how he's going to be coming. He's going to be coming in to show himself as your Savior because he's going to be riding on a donkey, you know. And so he comes riding in, and everybody shouts, Hallelujah, the, the one, the son of David. And the religious leaders are the one that says, Will you tell them to stop? Do you know what they're saying? And he said, if I told them to stop, the stones would cry out. And so the thing is, God knew. Because back in Isaiah, Isaiah in 53, it says he was despised and he was rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And so then we think, well, you know, he's born in the manger. Okay. But can you imagine his mother? You know, people saying, huh, huh, you know, she'd been around somewhere. You know, that ain't Joseph's baby. So she suffered persecution from that. And then even Jesus, when he was talking to the religious leaders, they said, we know who our father is. We weren't born of fornication. Even the religious leaders were putting him down. You know, and so you say, I know the pain, I know the sorrow, I know the frustration you're going through. He said, because I was that way. Even his own brothers and sisters didn't believe it until he was resurrected from the dead. You know, and then you go on farther. Daniel, Daniel prophesied in chapter 9. He said, you know that the Savior is going to come. And it's 70 weeks prepared for your people. And those weeks were like years, you know, 77s. And you add them up for years. And it says, from the time of the decree. Now, these people, way back during his time, Daniel's time, they were held captive over in Babylon. But Daniel was studying the books of Jeremiah. And he said he realized they were going to go back. And so Artaxerxes was then the ruler over in Persia then, which was now Iran and Iraq. And Artaxerxes gave a command that the people could go back and rebuild their temple. And he said, from a certain time that they go back, like three score would be 60, and so many years after that, Messiah would be cut off. So they could go back to their records and see when Artaxerxes gave that decree to go back and count the number of years, and they would be able to say, he is the Messiah that came on Palm Sunday. But they didn't. They rejected him. 
And so then the thing is, when he was a little bit later, you go through Luke there, and it says that, you know, his family, after he was born, they had to take him up and have him circumcised. They had to do that on the eighth day. And on the eighth day, they realized later on, is that that is when the uh, vitamin K builds its strongest in the body to coagulate the blood. So if he would have been circumcised any sooner than that, he could have probably bled to death because his blood wouldn't coagulate. So God knew ahead of time exactly. And then they had, after they gave birth to a boy, they had to purify themselves and stay away from the temple or anybody for 40 days for a boy. It's at 80 days if you give birth to a girl for the cleansing. And so here they go up and circumcise him. And then, but I want you to get the picture of when he's in, when he's there in that cattle cross when he's born. <coughs> and the shepherds, they see this and they say, let's go to Bethlehem and see this. Can you imagine Mary trying to nurse that baby just sitting there and all of these dirty shepherds come in and boy, they're probably stinking. They've been in the field for weeks, you know, and they, what in the world is going on? And then when they left, they said they went away and they were praising God, shouting hallelujah and all that going back. And everybody they met, they were rejoicing and saying that the Savior was born. But when the angel appeared, the first angel just said, Good tidings, you know. Then he said, all of a sudden, a multitude of heavenly hosts were there. Can you imagine, you know, about a thousand or two thousand angels all at once saying, glory to God, glory to God. You think everybody in the whole town would have woke up, don't you? And then he said, but here's a shepherd say, go back glorifying God. And then telling everybody about him. And then you come down to when he's about 12 years old, He's up there in the temple, and his parents go back because they were up there for the sacrifice, and probably he was going to have the bar mitzvah after they're about 12 or 14. They be declare themselves as a man, you know, for the man. And so they're up there in the temple, and so his parents are ready to go home, and the women usually go back first with the children because they walk a little slower, and so then the men would come back later. And then all of a sudden they realized, they said, was Joseph, was Jesus with you? No, I thought he was with you. No, he was So they go back and say, they couldn't find him for three days. And when they found him, what did they say? He said, to Mary said, why did you treat your father and me like this? We were worried. And Jesus said, you know, Joseph was not really his father. He said, don't you know that I must be about my father's business? He corrected her in a nice way, saying, he's not my father. He's my father. And then later on, when Jesus was up there, he said, I am the bread of life. If anybody is hungry, let him come to me and eat and drink freely. You know, and his brothers and his sisters and his mother's outside of the crowd thinking, he has lost it. He thinks he's God, you know. And then somebody said, hey, your mother and brothers are out there. And they want to talk to you. They want to get him out of there. I thought he was nuts. And he said, who is my mother? Who is my brother and my sister? These out here who want to hear and know the word of God. So all along the way, he was preparing himself. But then when he said that to his mother, it said that he went home and he was subject to them and he grew in favor with God and man. And now, you know, and I'm going to stop with this. A lot of times when we come to Christmas, we love those Christmas carols we sing, but a lot of those things are false, you know, because... What we sing, peace on earth, there is no peace right now, and it won't be any peace, lasting peace, until the Lord Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom. And so the thing is, we're all so glad to hold that little baby. Isn't he sweet? Isn't he wonderful? But then people say, 
Uh, I don't want to hear about the cross. I don't want to hear about those nails going in his hands and in his feet. I don't want to hear about the blood coming down his face from that crown of thorns. I don't want to hear that. And he says, but you have to hear that because he taken your place. And if you don't want to have none of that, you can't be none of his. And he said to his disciples, take up your cross daily and follow me. Now, we're not going to be nailed to a cross, you know, but we're going to be, you're a Christian? Hey, get with it. Get with the times. You know, that passe. And we see churches after churches closing their doors. And then we see these different kinds of activities of Satan coming against the church, like the people in both the Catholics as well as the Protestants are defiling the children because they're taking advantage of them in their Bible studies and in their classes. And so we're seeing that people are saying, I don't want any of that. And we know that we're going to be persecuted. In the service, you can't say a prayer in Jesus' name. You know, so the thing is, we have to realize that he's not just that little baby. He was born to die. That's why he came. And he said, you know, there's a poem that says, he came to die on a cross of wood, but he made the hill on which it stood. You know, the God of the universe, he said he gave up everything to come down here. He became poor. And when even they went to the temple, they have to give a sacrifice for the first male child because it was required that the firstborn male was supposed to be dedicated to the Lord. So instead of dedicating, the Lord said, I'll take all of the Levites, but you have to purchase him back, and then that money will go to the Levites. So they went and they gave two turtle doves. Two turtle doves were for the poor people. You know, and so then later on when the Magi came, we don't know how many there were. We say three kings, but there must have been a whole army because it set all of Jerusalem into an uproar. And then they came and they brought gold and frankincense and myrrh. And so then that was a wealthy thing because frankincense and myrrh were very, very expensive. And the reason... God was preparing them ahead of time because they knew that Herod was going to kill all of the babies. And they were warned in a dream to go down to Egypt. You know, and I'm going to stop there, but they needed that money for their transportation back and coming back up into Nazareth. And the thing is, when you go through Christmas, it's not about, what did you get? What did you get? What am I getting? You know, it's, Lord, how can I please you? How can I praise you? And so, if you would just say, Lord, help me not to be so selfish and so centered, self-centered that I forget there are millions upon millions upon millions of people in the world who have never heard. And here I am with all of this stuff. And you know, and we want more, we want better and it breaks my heart sometimes mm-hmm. when I see some of these preachers who have six or seven million dollar homes and some of them have fleets of jets that so they can get here or there faster. And, you know, when they're paying millions and millions of dollars for them, they could feed the poor, the hungry, the homeless. You know, it breaks my heart, mm-hmm. you know. And because when you see what Jesus gave up, to come to meet the needs of those poor people, you know, that he could take them to be with God. And that's what he said. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And he gave his life for all. But he says, whosoever will may come. But you have to want him in your heart and in your life. So if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior today, it's very easy Just say, Lord Jesus, I know you died for my sins. You took my place on the cross. Mm -hmm. I want you to be my Savior. Come into my life. 
right now. Now we're going to take this and I want you to think long and hard. Now sometimes these things it'll take long and hard to get them out. But I realize that if you take your finger and wet it sometimes and you put it on that little flap there it'll come up and you get that little wafer out of there. And then I want you to think about Jesus says, this is my body, and this is my blood. And now he wasn't teaching cannibalism. I don't want you to think that. But, you know, in the book of John, in the first chapter, he says, the word was with God. The word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so that is the birth of Jesus right there. He is the word. He is the voice. He is the expression of God that lets other people know who he is. Without the voice, you would never know. So it says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So make sure, Jesus said, don't take this if you don't mean it, that you want him to live in your life and to change your life for the better. Then he said, take and eat all of it. Yeah. Then he said, this is my blood. This <laughs> it's not supposed to be good, honey. It's supposed to be bitter. Because Jesus suffered for us. And if it's bitter and sticks to the roof of your mouth, that's all right. <laughs> That's a little bit. And this, he said, it was my blood. Drink through all of it. You know, and I knew a song that used to say, washed in the blood. And the lady said, oh, don't sing that. She said, I can just see blood coming over. And he says, you have to be washed in the blood. It's holy blood that he shed for you and for me. So as you take this, realize, that this represents Jesus until he comes back, and it could be soon. I'm done. You're done? <laughs> okay. They said, then they sang a song and went out. But we're not going to sing a song. We're going to stand up and hold hands, and we're going to pray. Oh, yeah, she gets to hold my hand. I want to hold your hand. But anyway, oh, that? Can, oh that's not a chair. <laughs> <laughs> and we want to thank everybody who brought the food and the goodies and stuff like that. Amen. And it was very, very good. And it you know, tastes like that bread was not good. It tastes like old grass. Good. <laughs> Have you been eating old grass? How do you know it tastes like an old body got uh, uh, yes, yes. Okay, let's pray. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you that even though you were born as a baby, you suffered even as a baby because you had no place except a hard, cold, stone crib <laughs> then when you rose to be a man you were put in the tomb again wrapped in swaddling clothes but Lord we thank you and praise you that you didn't stay there in the grave that you rose again and we can live with you if we asked you to be our savior and we know that you'll take us to be with you in the future so we ask Lord that you'd Bless us as we go our separate ways. Help us that we can bring honor and glory to you with the things that we do and say. And may we always say Merry Christmas at this time of the year. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Oh, well, Jason's trying to have a race to see who can get done first. <laughs> she does that. I know. I know. Uh, I know.